Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus began to speak in the synagogue at Nazareth. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow, a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. I've only ever been at most a casual football fan. But I'm only too aware that for many people, football is like religion. It's funny, though. We think of football games as unpredictable, and that's why you can bet on them. But from a certain point of view, virtually everything about them is completely predictable. The rituals surrounding the start and end of the game are familiar and choreographed. The starting time, duration, quarters, and half time the rigid formation of offensive and defensive lines, the player's statistics are known in depth. And even the plays themselves follow patterns that broadcasters can describe succinctly. It's true, some details and the outcome of the game are unpredictable, unless you know which team's fans were more faithful in attending church and then you just expect that God made their victory inevitable. We think we love sports for being unpredictable, but really I suspect that at least as much of their appeal lies in their familiarity and even their predictability. In a world that's changing ever faster and full of hopeful and terrifying surprises, our sports are comforting rituals where change comes slowly. While the professional franchises are owned by a tiny wealthy elite, sports still, feel, still make us feel that at least one part of our life is safely under our control. I think that's why, for many people, religion is like football. We're susceptible not just to quoting scripture for our own purposes, but also to projecting our own preferences, perceptions, and priorities onto God with such intensity that we effectively remake God in our own image. We become so determined to believe that God is whom we want God to be that we end up ignoring God or even rejecting God. Now, humanity has been doing this as long as we have known God. The problem is not that God's revelations to humanity have been insufficient. When God became one of us in Jesus Christ, the most perfect and most accessible revelation of God that ever could be, we rejected God with the utmost force. 
Today's striking gospel doesn't even encapsulate that rejection, but merely foreshadows it. Fortunately, this story also foreshadows our hope. At least, I hope this story is symbolic, since it doesn't make much sense, literally. It's unclear whether the congregation is starting to turn on Jesus when they said, is not this Joseph's son? The Greek is ambiguous. Or whether Jesus deliberately provoked their anger. He might well have provoked them, because they were becoming a little too pleased with him. In turn, because they thought they'd hit the jackpot with him. Apparently they'd heard that Jesus had worked miracles in another town. So they might reasonably have figured that he has to do even better things for us, since we're his hometown, we're his people, we're his extended family. So of course, Jesus had to disabuse them of the false notion that they controlled him or that they were entitled to get whatever they wanted from him. So Jesus points out to them that God has a track record of performing miracles for the least deserving, for the ultimate outsiders, not just Gentiles like the widow, but a Gentile like Naaman, who had made war on Israel. Yes, God did choose Israel to have a special knowledge and intimacy with God, and God blessed Israel abundantly, but out of grace, not obligation. Jesus drives the point home by pointing out that Israel's own sacred story shows that being God's chosen does not mean that God lets you benefit every time. Then the story gets weird, not because the congregation doesn't like what Jesus says. That part makes perfect sense. Rather, it's how they take their anger out on him. It's a long, steep hike from the valley floor where people in ancient Nazareth lived up to the surrounding hilltops. If they'd wanted to kill Jesus, they could have saved the exertion and attacked him right there. Instead, they drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill. This so clearly foreshadows the crucifixion that I think St. Luke let theology overshadow history this time. But that's not even the weirdest part of the story. Just when we'd expect either the crowd to succeed in throwing Jesus off the cliff, or we might expect Jesus to turn the tables on them, not necessarily with the miraculous show of strength that would have been playing into their hands and upholding their expectations, but maybe he could have at least said something to change their minds, turn their hearts something along the lines of, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. You know, something appropriately punchy and memorable. But instead, we get the most anticlimactic of anticlimaxes ever. Maybe Luke is a better storyteller than we give him credit for. Maybe Luke is challenging his audience here, defying our expectations, giving us a taste of the same medicine Jesus gave to the crowd. One optimistic commentator supposed that they let him go because they thought he might just be the Messiah. Well, okay, maybe. But I think the answer lies in another layer of symbolism, a different perspective. And I think there is indeed a subtle miracle at the heart of this story. Because even though the only reason the crowd had for bringing Jesus up there was their hostility, nevertheless, they wound up putting Jesus in the only appropriate place in town besides the synagogue. Because the hilltop doesn't just symbolize the crucifixion, 
the Mount of Golgotha. The hilltop also symbolizes Mount Sinai and the Temple Mount and the uplifted hearts of all faithful people, all of the right dwelling places of God. Though the crowd was acting out of their rejection of Jesus, his very being was so powerful, his love so immense and definitive, that inexorably they wound up drawn into a form of worshipful relationship with Jesus, however imperfect it might have been. So the story ends the only way it could. It ends the way its symbolic antecedents did, with Jesus continuing on his way, and the people left to choose whether to follow him or not. While Jesus wasn't one to shy away from a vigorous journey, I'm sure he would have preferred it if his hometown crowd had simply listened to his message and followed his teaching of spiritual renewal and rededicated themselves to following and worshiping their wild, untamable God. But our Lord is always willing to meet us where we are, no matter where we might be. So profound is his love for us. Even when we try to make religion like football, God is still mystically at work in our souls. God can always beat us at our own game, for God knows our whole playbook and uses even our intransigence to advance God's plan. So while our preference for seeing in God our own reflection, our inclination to domesticate and demystify God is a real problem and one we ought always to guard against and push back on. Ultimately, God will break through our defenses, for God always has possession of our hearts. We might, we might in our stubborn sinfulness slow down God's offensive drive, but in the end we know that God will win this and every game. God will lead us into the end zone of heaven, where there is no penalty for excessive celebration. Amen.